Hotep. I, I humbly appreciate uh, all of the uh, feelings and expressions of support and um, appreciation that I have received from all of you all this evening. Uh, those uh, most uh, humbling interpersonal feelings uh, have a lot to do with one's desire uh, to go forth. And I, I humbly appreciate those words I have shared with you, uh, the hugs, uh, the handshakes, uh, the looks deep in the eyes, uh, those are some of the most valuable moments, and I humbly appreciate those from you. I would uh, never want you to uh, underestimate uh, the importance of this platform and never have you underestimate uh, the role you play uh, in informing Africans around the country because I don't think it's one city you can go in that you wouldn't see the freedom, freedom fighting from the slave theater that you would not find that information somewhere in that town and people respond, they talk to me out of the tapes and all of the other people who came through here have taken an awesome responsibility to educate the country. And I never want you to underestimate the value and the role that you play to back up the leadership which allows them to stick out, to reach out for people to share what has become a nationwide network. Uh, you don't know how many people have called me uh, on behalf of your leader uh, over the last a couple of weeks for, for many people, they were exposed to Alton Maddox in a revolutionary dialogue for the first time. And around the country, it's a strange thing, is, as I believe whites used the C-SPAN program to try to inflame whites to cast a certain reflection on the Monday program, I understand that on one hand they had to communicate it while they hoped for a, an additional level of repudiation. But interestingly enough, they didn't take it as far as Monday too far. They kind of didn't even try that. They needed Monday as much as we did. But Alton Maddox was seen around the country. And for many of the people who have only heard of him through Tawana Brawley's case or some other activity in New York as you would see him slamming across something got to for the first time through the program that brother Malik had to a pick up on the strengths of the brother on another level the strength of some of what is the strength of the million man march uh, had to do with some of the things that brothers did as a result of being together at that moment. Uh, the march, or that coming together, but more specifically, a little brother Malik. And Malik and I have battled and pulled and hugged and scratched and fought and worked together, and I have watched this brother grow, but as the fact he has this program and he brought the rest of us near each other, it in fact allowed brother and I to get close enough to each other to begin to reapproach our fellowship, which slightly had something to do with me not being here in a while. And I can attest to, with other brothers, different things that were dealt with in the spirit of brotherhood at that moment that work through some kinks that have allowed all of us to expand our operations. And I'm most appreciative for the pain that Malik took. As he was warned not to, he was told not to, he was thrown out of different meetings as he was being warned not to have the Holocaust weekend prior to the Million Man March as if, as if 
some other persons other than ourselves were demanding a certain level of behavior and attitude from African people on that weekend and we were still carrying a grudge against the honky. Uh, that's the only other reason why someone would not want to advance what we were doing. I know they didn't think they got there alone. I know that. But maybe some promises had been made. Uh, we will, over the course of the evening, talk about some things. And I do want to talk some about that. And, uh, no, no, don't get excited. But most specifically in relationship to Ben Shavers, too, I want to focus there for a reason. Because we've gone, last time I was here, I said he wouldn't last but 16 months. That was the night he got the job. He lasted 17 months, to be exact. Since I can come here to tell the story, it was on, it was right on, just 30 days short of correct. So we know a little bit about the tendency. Anyway, uh, I'm most appreciative uh, for have uh, gotten a chance to be with the brother. And as we reached a hug, Let's, let's hug again, and we got to sit with each other and spend some time with each other. And because of that fellowship, I'm here today. And I'm most appreciative for our growth. But, but even though I was not here, I probably more than some took the spirit of what happened in this room around the country because you saved this brother's life. That is Eric over there, ain't it? You saved this brother's life right here on this podium. You did that. And that you did that had to go all over the country. And I went all over the country showing Eric here one night, Sharpton, uh, 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 um, uh, Barry Shango, uh, Sister, Sister Pat, uh, uh, Dr. Clark, uh, uh, Brother Maddox, uh, Conrad uh, Mohammed, uh, Brother uh, Eric, and then Khaled. And those two nights were some of the most significant nights in the history of the maturing of our race. Now we're not... And, and, and that applause sometimes slow my rhythm down, so let me get on with it. I'm not used to being applauded, so it made me feel uncomfortable. Um, so those nights had to be communicated. There was weight in the dialogue. There was weight. Eric could stand here and tell you what was going on, but people in L.A., People in Kansas City, brothers and sisters in Chicago, Houston, Dallas, get confused when they feel certain interactions between the Africans and don't have any information to base their loyalties and preferences on. If you choose to prefer something, prefer it on the best evidence. Don't let it be emotional. And things happen here that saved the Million Man March. No, you don't, you will, you will greatly underestimate what goes on up in here. You sometimes, and I think you can get the feeling that if you saw the Million Man March, that is really the little people's thing. It's when the little people show it's a big thing. The leadership ain't got nothing else to do but to be there. But when the little people show the ones who get in jeopardy if they gave up a day of pay or spent money they didn't have they're suffering for now where it meant the most. A millionaire spends 100. A 50-year spends 150. They made the greatest sacrifice. But here in this room, you did some very awesome things. And it helped people a lot to hear what was going on here. And these tapes became as influential as an evening could become 
in the word or the unspoken word of black power. In the 60s, due to immaturity, we tended to kill each other because disagreements between brothers had no standards involved. So you could kill a brother in a disagreement and go meet with a hunky and work some shit out because there was no principle, but assassination, again, is not an option in disagreements between brothers. And so when that happened, Brother Maddox rose to the occasion and went even beyond the strength he thought he had and laid down some laws and some rules that compelled that second night when everybody came together. That was an awesome fireman's work because he put the fire out. Put the fire out. And that compelled the minister to come and speak, meet, meet him again, take him to Chicago and clean up a bunch of other stuff that got them back together again. But it come off of the weight off of this podium. And so again, I never want you to underestimate it, uh, and it's excessively significant. The message that Khalid sent the night he spoke here for only five minutes, the message he sent that night was worth five hours of lecturing. It may have sent the final signal that made reproach the only way out. And it was only five minutes. You still back there, brother? Sure, you're right. It was the most powerful five minutes a brother ever give. It was. And you show, brother, you show, I think, the strength and the inside of what was in your heart. And I think just by going there, going to that spot, that a real man can't deny that you compelled what became the reproach. And that was an awesome signal as well. And I'm also a little curious, Brother Collin, that the whites didn't want to punish anyone for you coming back. Barely even brought it up. That's not an opinion. We can check the records on that for history. We meet and make a note of what did white people say when Khaled went back? And did they make any demands on his return? Because Brother Maddox did again lift the standard. We as an African people must have a standard of behavior. So a million man march can't be used to wash the sins away of men who use the stage and the projection to change their image and behavior. All right. All right. Don't get confused. Don't get confused. Don't even signify. That, that's not even the question. Because we, we can get, as we will, into the specifics of that explanation so you would understand it better. It is important that no one gets away scot-free on a moment. Because that was not the test of black. The march wasn't against anybody. You could come out and affirm what you are. You can ask for forgiveness for what you did. But you didn't have to fuck with no hunky in particular. And when we begin to call those names, yes, then the shit will break out. But the brother brought the standard of the night of the Holocaust Conference when he raised the question that the litmus test to atonement and reproach of brothers is on the table of Khalid Muhammad. Because it cannot be that forgiveness would run out of juice when it got to the more militant wings of the African community. We could forgive a sap, but no forgiveness. Not even that forgiveness is the question. No, no fraternity, 
no brotherhood for the, for the revolutionaries. So it's all right. It was a great, I loved it. I loved it. It was an awesome. I wouldn't be here tonight without it. It was an awesome thing. And our responsibility in setting the standard to keep the set on right motion compels us to have to lay certain things into the sea of communication of our people and keep the standard of the advancement of our race on appropriate course. And the brother raised the question. The question needs to be answered the first time they come back to their next leadership summit. We've gone a long way with these brothers. They've been in and out of being together for months and years now. You remember me telling you in the past, they first got together over in Africa at the first African summit. And they did a big story. We are together, uh, we are together at last. And Brother Coakley caught shit on the point for raising the question that I could not accept Coretta Scott King, Joe Lowry, and some of the other people who were over in Africa acting like Africans, but in my analysis of the enemy, they were their loyalist supporters. I couldn't accept it, so I did that Africa 93, colonialism is back. Africa 94, can whites build a constituency for Africa? I attacked Randall Robertson for taking the Rockefeller money, the Ford money, the Carnegie money to build that constituency for Africa. I attacked Leon Sullivan for the Institute for Self-Help in Phoenix that had George Champion, the former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, as the, as the head of the group that sponsored the summits in Africa. I couldn't take that and do my studies too. So I raised the question and I remember even I went to Richmond, Virginia, a brother from the nation sponsored me. He saw me, uh, Malik had, you show, boy that Malik, you have done some things brother. You have brought people together, things are working through you, but you brought Minister Farrakhan to Howard University's gymnasium and packed the house. The Howard gym was jam packed as the minister made his return into DC on the back of this brother. But while I was in the, uh, in the hallway hawking the tapes, a brother in the nation from Richmond, Virginia walked up and bought a tape on the boule, took the tape home, and brought me to Richmond. And on that weekend, I raised the question of the summit in Africa and some meetings with some rabbis and everything, and it, it got the brother in trouble. For having brought me there, it got him in trouble, and eventually he was expelled from the organization. He was told not to do Steve Coakley. He wasn't doing Steve Coakley. If at best, throw me out. Just if the facts are right, go with that. Right. If the facts are wrong, bring better facts. Right. If the facts are unimportant, declare I'm on remote control. Right. So then they were all right there. That was in May. And then came the March on Washington. You remember the 30th anniversary, this is 1993, that the 30th anniversary of the March on Washington. You remember that? And let me tell you what happened. If you don't remember, what happened was a rabbi named Saperstein wrote a letter, told Bench, no, he didn't write it in August, he wrote it in June. And that's important to know when he wrote it. The march was in August. They come from Africa in May. In June, Saperstein throws the letter down saying that your plans to have Minister Farrakhan are unacceptable to us in the Civil Rights Alliance. Now a little sidebar, just a little point of information. Randall Robinson is protesting in Washington DC, Brother Maddox, against the Nigerian embassy. He's walking on Nigeria got money from Carnegie, got money from Ford, got money from Rockefeller, but he walking on Nigeria. Now that's skewed in itself. But one of the people he got on his poster supporting his walk against Nigeria is Rabbi Saperstein. Make a note of that. Again, the standard is, if Nigeria is bad, what is Saperstein? And would you take money from a hunky to walk on a brother? All right. 
just, that's a footnote. That's not even a program. Just put that to the side. Now, because the Saperstein shows his ass up on numerous occasions. So Saperstein puts the pressure first on Ben Chavis. He's been proven consistently to be a weak link when challenged by honkies. No, because he repudiated us the weekend of the Black Holocaust event. He went on crossfire, talking to a Rhodes Scholar, Mike Kinsley. Now, here's the thing. Brother Coakley has profiles on all the hunkies in the media, all the hunkies at the banks, and all the spots. Now, if you're going to walk across a field of hunkies, it ain't beneath your character to come to my table and say, Brother, you got something on uh, 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 Kinsley and Sununu and uh, uh, such and such. I'm going up on Crossfire. You got some shit I can use to jam them if they jam me. I would give it to you for free. I would give it to you. But they go on these shows with the whites with no conditions, no control, and no questions on the hunky character, and sit there and accept questions, challenging their questions, their motivations, and their feelings. And then we get situations where Chavis repudiates Khalid, repudiates Malik, repudiates Maddox and Coakley and the whole squad, and talks with the Rhodes Scholar Kinsley, who is Jewish. White, he's white. He uh, practices the Jewish religion because Jewish is not a religious group. I mean, a racial group. Okay, so Kinsley attacks him, challenges him about us. He then repudiates us, but then he ain't got no knowledge on the Cecil Rhodes move. He can't bring up no connection with Rothschild. He can't bring up the colonization of African people. He can't ask for no atonement from no hunky. He just sits and gets all jacked up and then throws us to the dogs, somehow believing that by doing that, he becomes what? A better brother? A bigger man? A better alliance of black men? He protects the point? Well, hold it now. Hold it now. I'm going to do. I'm going to do what Maddox did. Ben Shavis, this microphone is a community microphone. And if you ain't never been invited, I surely like to invite you here one night so you can talk to us about some of the things that you did. That this is the open mic. This will go around the country. It, it, am I out of place? Please forgive me for having extended him this opportunity. Been trying to reach him. Well, he went, let me tell you. Let me tell you. It's a funny thing. You had a hard time getting him in here because when I was on the West Coast, he had the audacity to go up in the spot I lecture at, the good life. And you all know from seeing them videos with the giraffes in the back. That's the good life in L.A. I do a lot of my material there. He went in there behind me after I did a radio show and got up with another brother named Tony and got out there and said, Coakley out here fabricating some dialogue about some organization called a Bouze or something. <laughs> because I had said, I'm for the Million Man March, but I ain't for Cornell West. And since it was a take it all or leave it all proposition, I picked and choose what I was for. I suffered a lot for black people. I wasn't going to let no Johnny come booty liquor come up there and get up being black. And I got to suffer for him when he out repudiated me at the Tonkin with Michael Lerner. I got the scars on my back. So I have the privilege to raise the question. He can't go to someone else and get forgiveness and he fucking me. He come to me to get that forgiveness. Only I can relent that. Oh, as a sidebar, one thing that has come up as a potential danger to the Million Man March has been the question called operational unity. You have to watch what is done in the name of that because in the name of that, you may be asked to do one of the, some ridiculous things. Operational unity says you get with the central thing because it's the central thing or you ain't with us. You are considered something else if you ain't with this thing. If you ask it, what is it, it might not even be able to say, or it all might not say together the same thing. 
But the question that we'll be together to be together is dangerous. We will be together on the purpose and principles of the finest ideals. And that is the formula for success. Nothing less than that. Well, now remember now, I'll go back. Mandela was taken out of jail. Uh, I'd ask any of you to tell me, what was the sentence Mandela had? What was his sentence? Okay, he had life in jail, right? Uh, what happened that got him out? What did, they, what did they call it? What did they do? Did they find him not guilty? Did they overturn the conviction? Did they uh, call it time served? What exactly did they do? What? Capitulated, what else? They had a, they, they had a meeting with the clerk. Agreed not to nationalize? Okay, what you actually told me was, is you really don't fucking know what the exact legal thing was that got him out of jail. That's what you're telling me. All right? I, I read you correctly. Now, let's go on. Uh, just a little sidebar. Whites controlled, before the revolution, whites controlled 97% of the wealth in South Africa. After the revolution, whites still controlled 97% of South Africa, and I thought that was apartheid. Now, here's how deep the conspiracy is. Were any of you at any time a part of an anti-apartheid organization or coalition? No, you mean, you mean all them years y'all were never out here free South Africa? Come on now, I got pictures of some of y'all now. Get up there, y'all know y'all was in some of that stuff. Ain't nothing wrong with that, come on, wasn't you? All right. Now the question is, who is the head of the anti-apartheid movement to free South Africa right now in New York? Who? It, Randall Robinson, he's at Trans Africa. The reality is there ain't no organization to fight apartheid in South Africa. You walked away for no reason at all, not even knowing the legal reason that got Brother Man out. The real reason is oncoming revolution. That's what got him out, oncoming revolution. Now, some people been in physical jail. Some people been in... Oh, so come on, now, hold it now. Let me, now, not, this is not the mental thing I'm trying... This is where you box a man out of society by stigmatizing him and raising certain things about him to allegedly keep him from fulfilling his obligations to be for everybody. Well, my only point is, is that jail ain't always a four-cornered room. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you free people up to fill a void of gap of directing the cattle when it appears as if the cattle are going for themselves. Now, unless you put this counterweight on it, it will get all lopsided. This is... Uh, Check and balance. Check. I don't know anything about his wife. I don't know anything about that. Hold on, hold on. So my question was, Mandela was brought out of jail, and you've shown me you could allow it to happen again without reason. And he was used to stop a revolution that was all or nothing. Even to the point that he had to suspend his relationship with his woman, who was an embarrassment. It almost reminded me of how Ben Shavers was with us. We've been married all these years, Ben. You want to divorce me now? Ben, when you was at the United Church of Christ, we was fighting for the black Jesus. When you was at the NAACP, working with the Ford and the Rockefeller Foundation, we stayed out here against them to make them respect you, hoping that you would take money and counter our power. Now that you came out and you're against those things, now we're glad you're back.
but you cannot ever, ever, on the blood of my family, get in front of another white person and repudiate the militant faction of this community, your ass is on the line. Now, hold it now, hold it now. I don't ever want you to underestimate me saying that because if nothing else, I meant it. And if you only heard me to execute that feeling is the responsibility of mine. But if he jeopardizes another man's safety, another man's safety, another man's safety, so that he can be secure, then he will be not expendable because that's not an avenue for a brother who disagrees with another brother. But he would be punished and only punished justly. So we remember it was Ben Chavis who told Minister Farrakhan he couldn't walk in that funky march on Washington. Right. Now, isn't it interesting? If the minister had been went on and walked in the thing, he might have not got involved in calling for this one. Right. You understand? Sometimes being spite, I couldn't go to that funky little 100,000 man march. Shit, I have a million men. I'm telling you, spite. I do not want you to underestimate this five letter word spite or is it four letters I don't even know spite is a powerful motivator sometimes it even beats being positive spite spite is a powerful mode I don't want you to underestimate the motion of spite so he didn't get to be in the march on Washington. That was in August. So you all remember the big meeting at the Black Caucus where they all sat at the table together. Right. Jesse, the minister, right. uh, 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 excuse me, uh, Ben Chavis, uh, Qu uh, Kwame and Fume, Kwesi and Fume. You remember all of them standing up there. Remember that? And at that time, they made certain, and in fact, for a little bit, Chavis and the minister spat at each other a little bit. Chavis made a commentary because the final call in defense of their leader rightfully came out and said with a headline, Pharaoh, let my people go. And put the same faces that they had had their arms around two months earlier in Africa, put the same faces on the cover and raising the question if they were owned by whites. The reality is they were then what they were then. But we go through this with brothers when everybody needs to learn firsthand what's a real African person. So we went through that and on that black caucus podium they made pledges to be together again. And in fact the final call headline responded, together again forever. And then came King College. Got to put all this together. All right. Go then came King College. Now at the Black Caucus, they made a covenant never to speak against another black man until they had all met privately or talked privately right. by phone. And nobody would break the chain of talking or getting forced to repudiate someone in the public unless they had first cleared it all with each other. But it was Ben again who right. broke that rank with Jesse. All right. Jesse is the one who knew prior to that that the ADL was going to move on college and ask the minister to submit to them in the public. Right. I'm going to tell you what he did. Right. He asked for the minister to submit to self in the public right. and apologize for college even before it was put out. Jesse was the inside man. Now, what is at stake? The life of Khalid Mohammed, right. a man who served this African community. How many of them million men did Khalid make a man? All right. See, you don't know. I saw Khalid. I don't know. You may have known him longer than me. But Khalid was a brother to brothers in Chicago. When he was in Chicago soldiering, and I was getting whacked all over Chicago for having a little funky Columbus Day. 
And people were scared to be around me for a little funky Columbus Day. It was Khaled who called me up and brought me to the nation and had those brothers, those laborers get together and pitch in and pay my rent. It was Khaled who did. He was just a brother. He looked over at me. He said, Steve, you know, man, get a shave sometime, brother. Get a little haircut, you know. <laughs> Come on, get with the organization. He, but you see, how many men did he touch? How many of those soldiers out there that walked, he trained them? That's right. you, you can't take an accumulation of that behavior and wash it away for a white. That's a mortal sin. So Ben has been quick to jeopardize another brother. And I'm appreciative of all those days he got up on the road and gave speeches early in the morning or late at night or missed his family. I appreciate that kind of service because it's hard work to get up there and to go to all those cities and do that. But a hundred days of hard work doesn't allow you a night with the enemy. So, the attack on Khaled comes. The Cain Khaled speech becomes another test of the whites as to whether or not they can break this so-called unity among the leadership. Khaled is repudiated in the public, called repundant. It was a mistake. But you know what? The hurt of it, the shame of it, the distrust that it sold was fuel to come forth for a million men. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes when you see your own ambition fall from your tongue to your stomach and you look at it yourself, and you think in hindsight, especially after adversity rose on May 30th of 94, that maybe that was not the right thing to do. But it was out of compensation for things like those that made someone want to come with an even greater contribution. Do you understand how adversity and success are all linked in the great sea of what unfolded weeks ago? And I started that by coming in this room, talking about Eric and Conrad and Khaled and Alton Maddox and the crew right. and what role it played in holding the Africans together. Just a little sidebar, what if those original profiles of the Oklahoma bombers, Middle Eastern looking slash Nation of Islam types, what impact would that have been? If someone hadn't come up with a better enemy, what impact would the Nation of Islam as a suspect in the million, in the Oklahoma bombing, what effect would that have had on the Million Man March? It would have made black men suspect. You wouldn't want to have been around no bombers. I mean, even though. You understand? So. You can understand the danger of that moment. It could have ruined the whole thing. I suggest to you this, that then they started to have those leadership summits. Ben Chavis eventually lost his job at the NAACP. Some things came out during that period that irregardless about whether he should be fired or hired, raised questions about respect of one's family. I know that some things there were not, not at all African. And again, it caused us problems as we all had to regroup and adjust as positions changed. And still, they began to meet Houston, Baltimore. The leadership summits went on. Private meetings were held. We were getting leaks out of meetings that suggested that different people were being sacrificed for advancement. 
And some of the leaking even helped, even though it could breed hurt. Just the fact that there was not a safe place to speak against another brother froze some brothers for speaking against people when they thought they were alone. <laughs> I got to, you know, uh, y'all understand it, so I'm trying to say the names. They know these names, and I don't want to put that stuff in the street. But I only want you to understand, don't you underestimate what I just said. I'm saying that brothers got some shit went on where people would tell on other people if they made an unbrotherly move. Oh, everybody was a suspect, and shit was deep. Now... Brother Collard gets shot at May 30th, 94. Remember now, and I said it in the lecture I did with Eric Mohammed, that the, my allegation that the National Security Council, who authorizes assassinations, used building up Khalid Mohammed in the media and the press and across the world to align him up as an object so hateful that assassination was due justice. He was being set up by the world to frighten African men. Brother, just the fact that you're here and you're out and you're not locked in a room shivering and shaking and worrying about what no man can control has given other people strength who might not have been fit to stand there. O.J. went to jail June 17, 94. He stayed in jail 464 days in a long trial. But the man who shot Collett 18 days earlier still ain't been to trial. Why is James Edward Bess never gone to trial? As I've gone, if I had the overhead, I would show you James Edward Bess laying on the ground in a striped straight tie. I would show you the UFC spokesperson Jack Chappelle. I would show you the chief detective Gary DeVena in the San Francisco Examiner and Chappelle in the LA Times describing the shooter as wearing a dark suit, a light shirt, and a bow tie. But Bess is laying on the ground in a straight tie. Why ain't Bess been to trial? Because the hunkies know we know more about that than they do, and every move they make, they're suspect That's right. and under our control. That's right. That's right. So they haven't done what they done with OJ. But there again, what would happen if there was a freestyle investigation into the assassination of Khalid Mohammed? Where would it grow? I'm now suspicious that the whites may have held this up knowing these interlocking relationships that made it happen that day. That now they may want to come with an ultimate divider by bringing up those inner connections if it'll dampen a greater day. I'm suspicious of that now. Thinking ahead. I also know as a sidebar, everybody's asked about it. I've been asking different people who knew him before this, and I don't know, next time y'all see Fulani, ask her, ask her, a, what she know about Bess? Do she know Bess? Now, I'm not saying anything is wrong, but if you ask, you could at least find out. All right. All right. I know I didn't know him beforehand. All right. If I did, I'd tell you everything I knew. If I thought it would make a lead that would save a brother's life, and it would be nothing less for her to do if she knew something about the attack of that brother then to spill the beans. All right. That's what a sister would do right. for a brother. Check. Check. 
And if you don't know it, then stand up and say, I know nothing. Then we can move on to someone else. But don't get no attitude about being questioned. Stick them up. Everybody's a suspect. Now, you will greatly underestimate the strength of knowledge. I mean, this is soldiers without bodies. I'm telling you, you have affected people's behavior by what has happened in this room without ever touching them personally. There's weight on these things. This is a weapon. You can only use it. You have to be sacred with this thing. Now, let's just... Think about something. So eventually them brothers kept going, leadership meeting in here and there, and all of them seemed to have found a way to work out each other. Then they was on Nightline, then they was on Larry King, then they was on Bev Smith and BET, and they moved right along. Now, interestingly enough, uh, uh, there's an article I want to share with you in the, from the Washington Post about three weeks before the march. It's a very important uh, article. And it just draws attention to the position people had for or against the march. I debated on the question whether or not this wasn't a relentless attack by the enemy to stop the march by raising the question, at what point did you identify the enemy's attack, date, time, and place? And if it was a week before, or three days before, or two weeks before, is that the time you really attack something to kill it? When you stop someone being in a Washington march in June, when the march wasn't until August. And we need to study that. In an aftermath of this, we need to go back through. I have here, I've been carrying this shit with me for four spots. I spent hundreds of dollars on every newspaper in every city I could find. I do these on these special moments to then study and analyze the flow. What did Angela Davis say? What did Julian Bond say? What did Mary Berry say? What did Colin Powell say? He said, I wouldn't go because I got a book signing. They said, nigga, that's not enough. We need more from you. <laughs> he said, well, what do you want me to say? He said, well, just say you, ain't, you wouldn't be there because of Farrakhan. Right. And he got on CBS with Paul Azan and he said just that, but that's not what he said at first. That's what he said after they told him. And Colin, I said it at the Holocaust, I'll say it again. Right. We got letters from brothers in Panama. Uh -oh. Whose houses this military burned. Whose jobs this military took. Whose hopes and ambitions for self-determining in their home country were lost the night you went to the stage on a full moon and invaded Panama. All right. Brother, you got to call out much more about your relationship with the army. In fact, I even give it to Jesse Jackson. He said something on the same CBS with his sons a week or two later. They asked him, said, what do you think about Colin Powell being upset about marching because of the rhetoric and such and such a Farrakhan? And Jesse said, well, understanding he worked for Ronald Reagan. I can't understand what problem he'd have with Farrah. He worked with Ronald Reagan. He served in the military. He raised the question. He said he, he got tow missiles with Ollie North. Right. Now, did he call question to the character of Ronald Reagan, a Casper Weinberger, a Frank Colucci who fucked our brother, Patrice Lumumba, working as a CIA flunky agent dog. Frank Colucci shouldn't have no relationship. He's the first one to hire Colin Powell in the military. As a man to repudiate some Frank Colucci punk. All right. uh -oh. Now also a little sidebar. Check out now, they talk that shit. Check the comments of Colin Powell's wife who says, if he runs, I fear for his... Mm. Mm. See, they talk that shit about they don't believe in conspiracy. See, but in reality, they ass is scared because they're individuals without an army. All right. All right. And come, Colin Powell had forced respect. If you're a general and you talk to a private, he's forced to respect you. All right. That's it. 
This thing out here, brother, you are back at the end of the line. You're starting from since you left Harlem. You don't jump out of that line and jump over in this line and bustle all up by the front. Get your ass in the back. And go through what you do in the military. Debriefing. Tell us some secrets. Prove to us you are our brother. Tell us them secret locations of the intelligence buildings that are all over D.C. under fake designs. Tell us where those missiles are hidden. Tell us about the Humit intelligence program. Prove to us you are our brother. Brother say you was in Panama. You know the devastation that the military brought as they went and swore in a hunky on a military base without even the presence of his own people. Yep, he could, he gonna be a president, but he swore a honky in over in a military base without even his own, their own people there. Selected by the U.S. government. Brother, you ain't bringing them principles up in here. Robert Woodson gets all set up to be a black man by several weeks prior to the Million Man March. They put that little book out there, A Race is Over, that was it's a Dzuzi book. You remember that? The End of Racism. So they want Woodson to be a big, puffed up, strong black man. So Woodson goes out and leaves a job with a group of hunkies who ain't shit. American Enterprise Institute, I've been tracking them for years. The boy here at Chase, Booker, Butcher, left here and became head of that, and it was just the right or middle conservative right side of Rockefeller's left side. If it wasn't American Enterprise Institute, it was Brookings. So we ain't gonna get caught up in, did he leave a place that wasn't worse than the white boy he'd left for? Anyway. So he gets built up as a brother. He leaves the institute because the book is racist. I could show you some position papers up in there that are trash and call for the elimination of African people. The book makes some doo-doo comments about race, but there's some shit come up out of there that was worse than what this boy, in fact, is slightly diversionary, in fact. We could stand here one night and prove it out. I'd make you get up and say, that boy was a fraud. But then he becomes the number one critic against the Million Man March after he gets puffed up as a brother. Anyway, Julian Bond, Julian Bond did cocaine with Andy Young. Got in trouble, the wife's told on him. Been at the NAAC for years, but the NAACP ain't been doing shit for years. Got a little TV show, jumps out on the Million Man March, and got all kind of prissy little commentary about what he can't go for. And he hates Ben Shavis, and oh, he's just all prissy with it. <laughs> and that little tramp in New York, Michael Myers. I agreed, I took the pledge never to call a woman a bitch. They ain't gonna get down. <laughs> I took the pledge. I ain't gonna do it. But I suggest to you tonight, one night we need to put a bag on that nigga head. And we don't need to hit him. I just like to cut his beard off and cut his hair off his head. Cut off his mustache and sent him out right. naked faced right. as a punishment, as a little spanking. Right. So if you decide to do that, you got my approval. <laughs> not that I'm so important at all, it's not even necessary, but a little spanking, I think he needs a little spanking. I don't know how he's lasted this long in New York, but I ain't gonna stop messing with y'all. Right, he don't come out. But we've gone out before. We could go out. <clears throat> now let's think about a climate. A couple of days ago, 
white boys out there doing jumping jacks. They in their drawers and shit. Hup, one, go to war, go to war, we're going to war. ba da 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 ba da 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 Say, who's that shooting? Say, another white guy. He said, what up? He said, man, this is the final days, man. We keep fucking each other up. White guy at Fort Bragg gets up and shoots some more white guys. Let's get a white guy here. Yeah. I know if you would have had the chance, you would have done such an act, but since he was there for us, <laughs> let us thank all those that are working for us. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it, but I saw I remember one day I was in LA trying to get on the plane and the airport was closed. I said, what's up? They said, Unibomber, threaten us. I said, who is this? He said, he's a white guy. So let's get a white guy a hand. <laughs> Unibomber says, publish my manifesto, damn it. Now, I'm in Washington, and in the Washington Post, you know, they printed it. Oh, I'm also going to tell you a little clue tonight. Brother Coakley predicts to you tonight that within the next six or eight months, the Washington Post and the New York Times are going to merge into one paper. Now, they already do the International Herald together, and if you buy it, you'll see Washington Post editorial, New York Times editorial, New York Times, I mean Washington Post. They just alternate every story all over. That shit is coming. Now, they already done bought the Boston thing. They got the Boston Globe. They're going to take, they're taking the East Coast. Oh, Baba, this going to come down in six, eight months. Yeah, three years in the making, right. They've been doing this three years. Check and also you see them Disney boys fucking with that Rockefeller Center. Let's give all that confusion some more hand, yeah. Anyway, down there in Texas, they had a fake Jesus sighting. Wacko. They stuck around there 56 days trying to see if he was for real or not. Why men say, now look, we ought to go in there and kill him. He said, but man, the mother, you know, he ain't black, but damn, you know, maybe he might know of something. Talking about some seven seals and shit. Now they sitting up making Stargate simultaneously and they trying to figure out, you know, what's up. So he's supposed to write some shit and on the day he's supposed to write it, he don't deliver. They say, this motherfucker, he ain't, he got diarrhea. He ain't no damn Jesus or nothing. Go in there and burn his ass. And they went in there and burn him. And while they was going in, the ATF in the front got shot by the ATF in the back. I ain't gonna ask you to give them a hand, but you know what I mean, you know? <laughs> and in fact, it got so bad for them that one group of whites fought another group of whites all the way up to Congress even jacked up the FBI director and demoted the deputy director and switched this one for that one and caused disunity amongst the whites. And then out the sky comes the good old boy weekend. Boom, of the ATF out there with the hanging nigga. Y'all heard about the good old boy weekend, right? But this shit just comes right out of the sky and shit. Just, they've been doing this shit for five years, but it shows up this year. Then they all up there, they let the militia boys go to Washington and get on national TV and talk shit for days. Saying all kind of shit, trilateral commission and talking all kind of stuff, conspiracy theories and spreading disunity amongst the whites. And it is most interesting. If you go to Ruby Ridge and see them shoot the wife of a white supremacist. Somebody that they love deep in their soul, they shot his wife and shot his baby. The snake starts eating his own tail, he's going so fast. They're over there ethnic cleansing him. But then they go to Dayton, Ohio to seal the shit up. 
What's up in Dayton? Oh, it's deep up in Dayton. Got an Oklahoma bombing. White boys say they up and they're fighting against the government. The, the Zionist occupied government and they got all these things they be talking about. And I be listening to all of this and say, go get them, white guy. Yep, you got the abortion boys. Now remember a year ago, they was killing out there. The abortion boys was killing the doctors who was doing the abortions. Remember that? Don't you forget that shit. Then they got these, you know, they put these movies out about the computers and how these computers were jamming up the airports and all this. Next thing you know, the L.A. airport is closed because the computer then went out. Say the little, a little fuse box in the corner been there 150 years, blows one little $7 fuse and the airport go blank. Then Seattle airport go out, New York airport go out. What about that little bomb they found up there at the New York airport, blew the little radar thing up right before the Pope and them shit came. See, they ain't want to talk about that shit. They got problems. They got the sons of Gestapo on their ass going out there bombing that train in Arizona system. Out in the middle of the desert playing hunky games. Yeah. At the AFL-CIO union in D.C., them new union boys been there closing down the 14th Street Bridge, taking over the city council meeting. I mean, they've been causing hell in white people. New Gendricks came out two weeks ago and threatened them union boys. Say, you close that bridge and them bridges down one more time and hold up them. Hundreds of thousands of people got to come in here and run this government. We'll, 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 we'll tear your union apart. Them boys walk right into the AFL-CIO convention. And Lane Kirkland, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Director of Chase Manhattan, Board of Directors of the Rockefeller Foundation ass, who let the jobs of the steel mills and the, and the, and the tractor companies and the car making companies, let those jobs leave and go to Hong Kong and Singapore because he was in on the world thing. Then made his deputy, Tom Donovan, in the Trilateral Commission, sharing up with Rockefeller, selling out the unions. They sold my daddy, too. And then now they have an election and the new Turks win. Now the ones who like to tear shit up and block shit down is in control. And Newt Gendricks came out the other day and said, this is the most dangerous day in unionism that we now have some union leaders who won't cooperate. Good, that's right. Now, a little sidebar. Remember, New Gendrick's white work for what country? Thank you. Didn't but one person in the room say the shit. New Gendrick's wife worked for, let me all hear you all say, is it real? <laughs> New Gendrick's wife works for? Is it real? At 12500 a month. As the advisor for U.S. Is It Real Business Development. Now remember, Newt Gingerich is owned by the man who's considered number one on the list of the October 95 Vanity Fair magazine. Newt Gingerich is owned lock, stock, and barrel by Murdoch. Ooh. Murdoch who is considered the toughest of the white boys of the New Turks. The New Turks, Microsoft and Gates, Kotzenbach and Disney, uh, Eisner at Disney, uh, Spielberg, uh, uh, Malone at TCI, Turner at CNN, McCraw, David Greffin, McCraw of uh, McCraw Industries, uh, the boy who run Bell Atlantic. These are the New Turk white boys. Intels. They're fighting for control against the old rich white boys. Check October 95 of Vanity Fair and October 94 of Vanity Fair. They talk out this war of the new rich versus the old rich. And it's a great day for African liberation. Wow. Now, in there, they say Murdoch is the baddest guy of all because Murdoch 
has a business operation that knows no boundaries. Says Murdoch has broken every rule that every country ever had against the amalgamation of corporations. Which is why he has a paper in your town and a television station. He did it to you first. He broke the chain with the post. And that was on the death of another, is it really, Robert Maxwell, who still may be alive secretly, hunky. We ain't stupid. <laughs> who worked as an informant for Is It Real Intelligence? Mossad, so you're right, Robert Maxwell. Now, Murdoch owns Gendricks. Remember, he was going to give him that $4 million. 500,000 without ever having written a page. Remember that now. You don't do that shit with a guy who wrote one book. And so Gendricks didn't know nothing wrong about that, takes it, and has to get spanked and gives it back. But Murdoch owns Gendricks, but Rothschild owns Murdoch. Now I want to tell you something, and this needs to be another discussion. I need to come back here another day and give this lecture. But quietly as it is, as quietly as it is, the white Jewish community has infiltrated key positions of power in this country and stand ready for a white insurrection on top of all of these white insurrections more than ever before. Just quiet. If I was to show you my little chart where I watch these positions as they move and shift, they're moving in in deep cover, in unprecedented ways, quietly, without much attention, in the confusion like the protocol said they would. The World Trade Center bombing has a yellow truck with rider on it. The Oklahoma bombing got a yellow truck with rider on it. The head of Ryder is on the Trilateral Commission. Ryder Systems Incorporated chairman is on the Trilateral Commission and his name is right under the Tom uh, Johnson, head of CNN News. CNN gives the phony description of the Middle Eastern Nation of Islam types. The Ryder truck is the car in collusion. But then they do the movie Clear and Present Danger and blow up a drug dealer's party for his child laying, laying a yellow truck out there using a laser guided missile. Got some microphone in the wall. Damn, Chief. What's in the back? Damn. <laughs> hey, Colin. You got my back? Okay, who's the head of the world? I don't want none of my friends answering. Who's the head of the World Bank now? Who? Preston? No, Liz Preston ain't it no more. Who? Okay, there you go. Somebody said it. I was going to do a little uh, panel. Who? What? No, but it's close. See, I was going to bring up Romulus and Remus. The two children are sucking on the bowels of a wolfing son is his name. And he too is of a is it really connection. But he headed James Wolfing son and incorporated right here in New York, the investment company, before he went down to run the World Bank. Anyway, he owned the, we, we'll talk about that. So we got the sons of Gestapo. We got the. Airports going blank, the Uni bomber, the Waco, the Ruby Ridge, the Oklahoma bombing. We got the California infertility clinic eggs squapping scandal where white people went in looking for pure white kids and came out with one white and one black. We got Canada fighting over whether it should be free and French or white and white. It appears as if all over the world there's great indecision and great disunity amongst whites. The poor white man is fighting the rich white man and another group of rich white men is fighting a group of rich white men. And what is the formula for all of that? The white man is setting up a system to save himself from an attack from another white man by calling on black man to rescue him. 
Seeing that they got brother man in the on deck circle, we're trying to close the game down to prevent brother from coming to the rescue. Yes, everywhere you look, certain brothers are being groomed to save America. But first, as they always do, they put it in the movie, Crimson Tide. Denzel Washington has to save Gene Hackman from a nuclear attack with other whites. Pelican Brief, he saves the whites with his reporting from a scandal around the presidency. In Dave, the brother Secret Service saves the president who really dies and saves this impersonator from being exposed as not the president and even in the, where else they go, uh, uh, outbreak. You got brother running the helicopter and the other brother Morgan Freeman telling on, yeah, we, yeah, we got the secret shit. Telling, always the brother man to assist the white man from an attack from another white man. Virtuosity, same thing. Denzel is the cop going into cyberspace, cyberspace to save the hunky. Yeah, and then you got uh, Die Hard, one, two, and three. Lethal weapon, one, two, and three. Canadian bacon, what's that black? I mean, I know it's some pork. That a flick? Okay. Uh, I even wanted you to pick up. Uh, how many of you all saw the flick, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle? Even the idiot could save the white family. The white people did hundreds of articles around the country about the paranoia of the militia, even suggested that those who were in the one world government were an indicator to those who would be violent. There were over 72 evacuations of major buildings in Washington, D.C., because now that the whites are all unrest, any time a white person calls and makes a threat, another white man acts on it immediately because white people know other white people are violent. Judge Sessions. I just want you to remember this. Let me stick this in here. This is some, this is some Coakley wizardry here right now. Now only the whites who is up on this shit will understand dropping this to you. For one day I have a tape of Judge Sessions' wife with an interview with him and she gets almost like Martha Mitchell did for John Mitchell and starts blurting out and tell them that they were in our house today that somebody had broken their house and was fucking with them, but he's head of the FBI. Now, just as a word of fact, Sessions was head of the FBI during the Ruby Ridge and the white coat thing. But in fact, they've admitted that line supervisors were making decisions about when the special forces would be used, what were the rules of engagement. I bring this up because these rules of engagement are significant to you as Africans because the rules of engagement will be important as we engage. All right. And the fact that they had to neutralize themselves over misbehavior makes them weaker in dealing with you. Right. You might not understand it, but Sessions got forced out. He got asked to leave and he wouldn't go and he made Clinton fire him. That's a heavy thing about some white, well, this is several years ago. Right when the time they was revealing that Ames CIA Russian thing. Now they still punishing Ames, but I got a picture of Gorbachev and Clinton sitting up on the edge of the Hudson. Looking out. Did they put that picture here? They were sitting on the edge of the Hudson looking out over the bay. They showed their backs to the camera. Y'all see that picture? You know what they were saying in the, in the caption? You didn't see it, but they were sitting in the chairs, and it just showed their backs looking out over the Hudson. They said, man, you see all them niggas at that Million Man March? He said, man, they're going to kick our ass. 
He said, let's send our troops down to Kansas and work together. Is that a check? In the meantime, Giuliani got his winky out trying to urinate on Castro, an Arafat. Winky dinky. Let me hear you say winky dinky is the mayor of New York. Now y'all was a little weak on that. Let me check you again. Winky dinky. Winky dinky. I mean, after all, I'm the one saying mayor is my ass on the line. All y'all saying is winky dinky. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. There you go. Anyway, 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 I only wanted to raise the question of Judge Sessions and why he was not in command of those troops that did the shooting, that did whatever they wanted. And since they weren't doing it for Clinton and they didn't do it for the director, and the only one left was the, the woman, uh, Attorney General Reno, and she didn't know shit about it, who was running it? Who was it running the upper middle echelons of the U.S. government with the authority to kill but no protection? Authority to kill but no protection because they got fed back out to the public. Anyway, I raised that question so you could think about it. So the rules of engagement and the use of special forces now rest solely on the director, Freach. These do have an impact on us. Think about the ATF and the good old boy weekends showing clearly they're not our friends. And think about the blacks around them who cannot control these whites' aggressions. But in spite of all of this, the FBI, the ATF, the Justice Department fucking up all over the place, soon as some shit break out, a group of Negroes get together and call in and ask for the Justice Department to come in and investigate. I'm telling you tonight, next time you see a nigga get in the public, and ask the Justice Department to come investigate some shit. You, you, if you can reach them, slap them. Because in consideration of how often they being investigated, to call them in is pure stupidity. I take great pride in the fact that the Million Man March didn't make a major mistake and go into Washington on a Saturday. Because I felt that to walk around a building when it's closed is a sick pathological tendency. You don't ever get caught having a protest when ain't nobody in the house. So they moved it from the Saturday to a Monday, but the Monday was Columbus Day. And that wasn't going to work because everything in the District of Columbus, including Howard University, is closed on that day. So that would have been just like a Saturday, a day when people could have left in the morning and been home at night and been at work the next day and not shown the break of resistance. And it was on the Larry King show, they announced they had moved the march a third time to October 16th on a Monday, which was the biggest gamble ever. This was a major gamble to take a chance on a million men on a Monday. And one of the, I got a tape, I, I just, I really, I'm, I bought all this stuff, I taped everything I could, I got people sending me tapes from everything related to the Million Man March and even the things prior to, because it's very significant, the day Bob Dole got up and made a speech on the floor of the Senate saying that we're going to have to close down on Monday because I don't believe you'll be able to get near the Capitol because it's likely to be a traffic jam. That was an awesome thing that the coming of those men compelled the business of the devils to stop. It was awesome. And several weeks before the march, when the little school districts began to announce that the bus drivers were seemingly taking off leave, one particular company in Alexandria announced that 42% of the staff had taken leave and they were announcing to the public that they were not going to acknowledge the leave of these drivers, so they had the cameras go to a meeting where all these ordinary looking, some 250 pound women, some 30 pound men, 
some seven foot tall men, some three feet tall women, some really ordinary looking Africans were sitting at a table, some with stringy hair, some with braids, some raggedy, some looking neat, some with their clothes all wrinkled and some with them pressed, asking that white man could they have that one day off. And the white man says no. And all of a sudden, more people call to get off. And the white man comes out and says, 42% have asked not to work. He said, but I fear that there are more people who will not come, but are afraid to tell me until Sunday or Monday. <laughs> That's heavy when you think about the plantation. Right. You've got to remember about the end of slavery, but the keeping of the deal. The end of slavery, but the keeping of the deal. Meaning they kept the whole thing. They let some people go, but they kept the whole thing together. You were getting such strength by escaping. Going from Alabama to Canada and never seeing the light of day. You were getting strength out of how you could go out the house, free 20 blacks, show up for work in the morning and act as if nothing had happened. You got strength out of that. And then all of a sudden, they took away the things that gave you strength and reduced struggle to cooperation. Now, there is an attempt, and we have to be careful not to allow the strength of that metaphysical moment to be spilled out with a political manifestation. I'm going to say it again. We must not allow the strength of that metaphysical moment to have a political manifestation. I asked last night at Hofstra University. In fact, as by the way, Eric Muhammad had to get me out of there the day I was in Hempstead after going into the hotel and the students coming with a voucher signed by the administrators to pay for the hotel room, stamped it to the little receipt that they had behind the desk. When I went to check out and the white man looked at the sheet, he could not believe that a black man would have a hotel room paid for by Hofstra. So I had to sit in the lobby for 45 minutes while they checked out the validity of the voucher that I just spent all night on. <laughs> and then finally, after they called, the lady calls the administrator and she says, but I didn't understand why he would have one of these. We've never had one over here like this. Had the purchase order, but we've never seen one. Oh, it was, and I just say, I just kept saying, imagine making $800 an hour, sitting there with some $12 an hour hunkies, holding me up, exercising their hunkyhood. But I need to tell you this, I saw all over Hofstra, Hempstead, posters. These brothers are working hard, calling for a 10,000 man march, December 5th, I believe it's a Saturday, in Hofstra, a West Hempstead, Hempstead, and I hope you all go to support them. Find out some about it, I don't even know who's doing it. I saw the brothers had the signs up, a 10,000, because this is what you need to remember too about the strength of the Million Man March. Every brother or sister that's isolated at a job or locked at a college or in a place where there are few blacks now have fear on the whites that at any moment they could invoke a segment of that million. So they fucking with the brothers at Hempstead. We say, give us 50,000 in Hempstead. Do you understand what you got going for you now? All the hunkies evaluations, remember this? Intentions plus capability equal threat. The uh, model that the intelligence community uses to measure a threat to the government or to a particular goal or project, think of the values that went up as a result of seeing the men and women. And how now every brother or sister does not seem isolated as the hunky. See, when Harold Washington won for mayor, every white person was approaching any black. Hey, you think you could talk to Harold for me so I could keep my job? <laughs> They just assumed that every black person knew Harold personally. So now you have to stand as if every one of them million are your friend and every time they get to fucking with you. 
You say, y'all didn't get the lesson, did you? That's all I kept telling the audience up there. Y'all didn't even get it, did you? You didn't even get it. Go on and show your ass. And then I start talking loud to the brothers that do the mopping and the brothers that do the luggage carrying and said, look at me, black man. I'm in some raggedy clothes and gym shoes. $800 an hour got to be jacked up by a $12 hunky. I know y'all sick of putting up with they shit. But that's all right, brothers. We're going to get you up out of here. We're going to get you up out of here. Anyway. Anyway, anyway. Uh, and... And, and so I raised the question at Hofstra about politics. Uh, how many senators are there in the Senate? Uh, uh, see, if I, if I jack y'all up personally, y'all be embarrassed by the shit y'all tell me. Last night at Hofstra, I stumped them. They didn't know. I asked Eric, he said 264. 246, right? <laughs> it's 100 senators. If we had an election tomorrow, there was a special election in 21 states where we got at least 20% population. If we elected 21 senators tomorrow, how many would we have? 22, thank you. If I, let me stop this before y'all start telling me some ridiculous shit. 22, because we got how many? Okay, so now there's a big showdown and they got a resolution on the table no, I wouldn't even use that because I was going to say it'd be a resolution on Khalid Muhammad. If they took a vote, what would the score be? And I was about to say the score would be 78 to 22. But knowing that type of resolution, it'd be probably 91 to 7 or some shit. So I ain't even going to use that analogy. But my point is, if we elected 21 senators tomorrow, which would be unprecedented, would we have enough to control uh, one piece of legislation. Tomorrow, if we elected a hundred congressmen, how many would we have? See, I knew I'd catch y'all on this one. If we had a hundred, how many we got now? One, how many congressmen? You know, Maxine Waters, Charlie Rangel. Huh? How many in the Black Caucus? 41. There you go. Somebody hollered in. I think it's two more that ain't in it, so it might be 43 in all. Huh? I mean, you talking about the 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 congressman? Well, we they they're not white. They they have they have melanin. <laughs> they act white. That's what you want to say. They act white. Some of them act white. Uh, but the point of this is, let me let me make this point quickly. Uh, the point to it is, is if we had a hundred tomorrow. And, we, and that gave us 141, and there was a vote tomorrow, what would the vote be? How many white, how many, how many congressmen are there? 435, because you add the 100 senators, that make 535 in the Congress, and that adds up to 13, like the 13 pieces of 13 on the dollar bill. I mean, I know you know that. Anyway, so, it would mean that the score would be 141 to about 298 or something. Which means that if we had this monumental election of 100 congressmen and 40 or 20 senators tomorrow, it would still not put us on course to whip white supremacy. Therefore, we cannot accept the political sucking up of the energy of the Million Man March with a political objective because we want to destroy those assemblies, not take seats. That's a policy position. And if one has a science, if they want to go get Ron Waters or Ron Daniels or anybody they want to pull up who has a political science thought, I worked in the balls of that thing to the butt of my bone. If you got the science, then I stand up with you it would be great to start having the great debates at this lady. Put somebody there and somebody there and put brother man in the middle. Oh shit, that'd be, listen, that'd be great. I, I, I like to call out some people I'd love to sit with, stand with. I'd take two over there, three over there and one over there. Or a team over here and a team over there. Anyway, in the fairness of clarity, not in repudiation. And for those of you who are leaving early, my tapes are in the back. There's some real good stuff back there that you, do, you should not want to miss. Anyway, 
Uh, so the Million Man March does not have a political manifestation and I wanted to make that clear. It would be good if each of the organizing committees at the various cities went back and began the project entitled, Let's Describe the Enemy. Because I believe one of the unifying factors now that we have atoned will be the enemy. And the enemy will unify us. Uh, some of those suggestions that I made about after the Million Man March is in a tape back there, Coakley on the LA radio on the Million Man March. Also, the night of the Million Man March, we analyzed the, where the police were, what rooftops they were on, about the color of the helicopters. We noticed on the day of the Million Man March, they used none of those green or black helicopters, which fly over DC 20 and 30 all day. But they didn't use any because they didn't want to inflame the millions. And that's interesting to think about that. And remember that a battalion, a military battalion, has 72,000 soldiers. How many soldiers were on call to meet a million or more? I mean, I just want you to start thinking about what goes on when you think about what's going on. Anyway, so uh, you would want to hear of that uh, description. Now, another thing about the Million Man March, we do not want uh, one of the things, and I have to give it to them, I felt they did a good job. You know, I have been more than any responsible for neutralizing the oath takers, uh, the uh, Boulets, the Greeks, uh, the uh, doctors who took the Hippocratic oath, and the lawyers who took the oath to the Constitution, and the police who took the oath to the municipality, and the soldier who took the oath to the Constitution and the army. I have been responsible for clarifying the potential danger that an oath taker could be to a black revolution. All right. But in the Million Man March, the Greeks did not do a bad job supporting the march itself. Uh, those organizations with hundreds of members, some of them moderate, did make the call for their members to participate. You even saw huge pockets of masons and moors and, and bays and eels all over the mall as units of organizations came forth to be represented. And that was an unconceivable merger of those rivalries. It was a major achievement for them. But now that the march is over, the ante is up higher than it was, you had to be against no one to be at the march. What happens when we start naming an enemy? So the march is not a test of blackness, for it in itself, it was purposely non-confrontational. Where will you stand in the face of an identified enemy? Your oath remains the obstacle. If I had a VCR, I'd show you Glenn Ford and Dean Jagger doing the oath related to the movie The Brotherhood of the Bell. And in there, they remind the oath taker that you may be called upon at any time to serve your uh, society. And you're obligated to adhere to it, or as in the movie, Glenn Ford and his family were destroyed for breaking the oath. And so I then show the Masonic. You know, Farrakhan talked about uh, Hiram Abiff. Did you notice how the whites looked at the speech and all of a sudden skipped over all the Masonic stuff and the secret stuff? And uh, they just skipped over all of that. They talked about the adoption. They talked about the registering. They talked about everything that was socially acceptable to them. And they left out all the other stuff as if they didn't hear it, but then when the march was over and they said, well, Farrakhan, you got 400,000 marches. And if you add the sum of those numbers up, you get four, and not four puts you on the square. So while he talked to them Masonically, they talked back to him Masonically. And he then, that would then make it the fourth largest march. But then here comes ABC Disney out of the background to do their own analysis of the crowd. Whites coming out of the back to assist in the counting of the people. 
and they come forth with the 800,000. Not quite allowed to say a million. You could say a million in speculation, 20% margin of error, possibly as high as a million too, possibly as low as 600,000, but definitely not 400,000. Whites fighting other whites on behalf of blacks. You just, just think about it, you just need again to remember that white on white aggression is in our interest. And that every opportunity we have to magnify it, promote it, instigate it, it's your obligation to do so. <laughs> Examine carefully the print media, the weeklies, the video news. Study ex precisely the commentary of those who were drudged out into the public. They had so warned the people in D.C. about the coming of the traffic of the Million Man March that in fact traffic was zero. It was lower than it had ever been ever before. We must examine carefully how or what the strategy was of the so-called enemy and in some cases Jewish enemy community because some of their activity needs to be interpreted as in fact whether they were in fact no more than dubious in their relationship about the march itself. In fact, I looked in one newspaper, Ron Walters is quoted as saying, you don't make a speech that long if you actually want people to remember it. There was a lot of numerology and mysticism that was unnecessary. But when he got down to concrete stuff, he made a lot of sense. Hey, you know, you being attacked, you the master builder, that makes some sense to me. Black man and black women are the master builders, that makes sense to me. Registering and vote, that's mysticism. Then here come another group of Negroes coming out calling for a, a national commission on race. Making sure that they can put the ball back in the hunky lap. Let the hunky control the dialogue about race relations. Let's have this race commission. Hugh Price of the Urban League coming out. Yeah, we need another do nothing federal commission. That not just studies but proposes changes. Go find out about the Christopher Commission changes. The shit ain't done shit. So why would you even bring that suggestion again? So you got to watch that carefully. Got to watch it carefully. I had brought some little documents about different things different people said at different times. I thought it was interesting. This was an editorial in the Washington, uh, this is the Washington Afro-American uh, editorial on the words said at the Million Man March. If you notice, this is Jesse's speech here. This is the minister's speech here. I'll show you. They ran Jesse's speech for all of that lined material. This is an editorial going from here to here. Jesse's speech is all of this, and minister is just that little piece right there. This is called post-march positioning. You have to watch it carefully. In some of these cities I've been in, there have been seven and eight and nine million man march meetings every night from people who wasn't even at the march hosting million man march meetings. Right. Brother Eric shared with me this commentary that was in the New York, and you should not draw any insinuation from that, anybody who studies the tape right. in Chicago or any place else, just don't draw any insinuations from it. We talk about all articles. This is not, hey, say this, brother. It's just an article that uh, talks about by J.J. Goldberg entitled Talk with Farrakhan. And it raises the question about why don't the Jewish people go on and meet with him? All the other shit they tried ain't worked. <laughs> <coughs> but when have they never stopped meeting? When did they stop meeting? No, I'm not saying it to draw suspicion, but there's a lot of false dialogue. Farrakhan doesn't know. He went to went you with the U.S. government and Colin Powell went with Jesse Jackson and got that black man married to the white man Goodman back from the who who had him Syrians. Didn't didn't he go do that? Now just but check this. Here's a man, a chief researcher for the Rules Committee of the City Council, goes up to the reception in Harold Washington's office for Goodman Jackson. Farrakhan, the governor of Illinois, Thompson, and Harold Washington. 
They all stood together in a grand reception as all of us walked through the mayor's office and shook all of their hands. Ain't nobody got up out the slave and went to no foreign country and rescued no military man. That ain't no ordinary activity. You don't forget nobody when they do that for you. So the question raised as they do all of this phony, reactive stuff, look deep through that and start raising some critical questions about whether or not it looked like wrestling rather than community fighting. And again, this is check and balance. Fulfilling our responsibility to keep all eyes open. Some of the feelings I felt, I think one memorable moment at the march, I was watching it on TV, Bernard Shaw was interviewing Kwesi and Fumi. And he asked them all these questions and he was getting ready to stop. He said, brother, he said, Kwesi, let me ask you this one question. How many times did you cry today? And the camera zoomed up on his eyes and the little tears started to trickle down again. He said, numerous times. He said, now I'm likely to do it again. And I remember getting up that morning, the morning of the Million Man March and turning on the television at 5 a.m. and seeing them brothers out there in the cold. It was cold that morning. And I looked up and they was proudly just walking through the little dew and the dusk and just out there and tears just rolled down my eyes. Just the feeling was, I mean, I, I hadn't felt like that since Harold Washington had won in the primary in the general in Chicago. Not the second time, it didn't feel that way the second time, but the first time it felt like that. But this felt even deeper than that because I know it was not for such a short thing as politics. In fact, it had no real reason at all. It was that great of a thing. It was even beyond a reason that I felt was used to decoy the whites from stopping it. That may have been one of the wisest things that the minister did was introduce a subject area that allowed all of them to get on with that. That might have been a shrewd projection. May have been excessively, but even still the Baptist Convention and others couldn't even get with that. And imagine he stands there and says, in spite of what they've done, join the Urban League, join the NAACP, and they have had to come out and admit their phones are ringing off the hook. But here's the interesting thing, the immovable object meets the irresistible force. What happens when these honest leaning people walk into these evil organizations? And the evil organizations ain't been doing nothing no way. Now they got all these people showing up at meetings where they usually ratified bullshit. We may have an unusual thing happen. They may start rather than to be embarrassed, go out and do some dumb shit for the people. <laughs> Not to be fronted off by the new people who come in who have their genuineness in their hands and make these corrupt niggas look at it and say, no, I can't fuck another person. And may turn around something in their structure. But then again, you someone said, nah. <laughs> But everyone will have the chance to fail again. That's what happened with everybody. Went with this slate and got the right to fail again. But the Million Man March, the brotherhood that I saw out there, I was very honored that the people that had brought me to these various cities that I've been at, I saw them all, all those cities that had ever brought me, I saw that weekend. And I felt strong about the hardcore realities that we shared that would make doing something as a million man march a natural manifestation of their African thinking. Take care of them. And I was really proud of that. And, and, and walking across that mall and hugging and shaking with people and, and, and looking in people's eyes and the children I sent for my son, I didn't really think about this. I said, damn, what about my own son? I had sent for my son and my daughter didn't want to let him go by herself. She agreed to wear a baseball cap. If the women couldn't come, she'd go as a boy. And uh, my three-year-old, who got in the subway, the day of the Million Man March, the subway was packed. And it was quiet and silent. My little girl, three years old, my walking around, Million Man March, Million Man March. And 
everybody in the subway looks down at her and she just million man march. And the look and the reaction of the people as they picked up pride off the three year old marching to the drum of the older ones. That was an awesome thing. And what has happened as these people have gone back, I was in a gas station the other day and Deco and another guy got to fighting. And I questioned both the brothers. Neither of them had been at the Million Man March. And I told them, if they had a, they'd have never gotten that fight. Because brothers, something happened. We start walking, we start reaching for each other, holding the door for each other, be on the train shaking together, being at the airport reaching out for each other, sitting at tables together where there are empty chairs and we'd sit at an empty table, we sit with the brother. This is, this is, this is unprecedented. And I don't care how bad the hunkies want to piss on all of those people in the leadership who were involved. And even past anything you may interpret as something negative I said, whatever it was that compelled that motion together, something even greater come out of them. And I'm most pleased, I'm most pleased for, if you think about even a brother minister who's a man, who took a lot of shit in the late days as people began to repudiate him and still be for the march. They accepted the safety valve. That's why I said, well, damn, we ain't, can't stop it, and they're going to have it, and he's going to be there, and then we're going to have to cover it. Well, make a nigga say I'm for the march, but not for him. They even did polls, 3% of the people for Farrakhan, 97% for something else. All kind of other safety valve checkoff spots to rationalize or make themselves feel at ease. But I appreciate the brother for enduring all of that. He did some things I might have not could have done as he was compassionate for those who had struck against him. That was a, yeah, and I, I do even appreciate, just as a thing, I appreciate this headline that was on the final call that said, to God be the glory just as a checkoff spot, but now let me just say this now, see something happened. I'm listening to the radio in Chicago and Conrad Worrell and Milana Karinga are on and they're talking about or sort of saying something that sounded almost like ridicule that said, don't be out telling the people God did this. Because th this now was bringing down a little underlying disagreement between nationalists and religious people. The question was, did the million men do it or did God do it? And so it started to be a little dialogue going on and it was underlying dialogue, but it was nevertheless being said in the public. It's terminology. Something greater than us was on the mall that day. It don't make no difference of whether you, what you call it. You could feel it. You could feel it. I'm proud that Cornell West was not on that. He was on the stage, but he didn't speak. And I'm proud of that. There's a tape back there called Insights and Reflections. I was attacked in LA by the regional minister of the nation, Tony Mohammed, who had suggested that I was fabricating this dialogue about the boule. That's the Tony that was hanging out with, uh, with uh, Ben Chavis. And there's a tape back there where I play this segment where he attacks me for creating or uh, fabricating the boule, and then Khaled comes to town and speaks up for me, and he gets maybe a little upset at Khaled for saying he may have fronted him off. But in reality, as we check, as even Brother Khaled said, he's a, he's a fraternity man himself. And the point rolls of whether or not he was a nation brother first or a Greek first. Because the boule does exist, and in L.A., everybody know it. You can't even go out there and say no dumb shit like that. All right. And I offered to him all of my information, but then when I found out he was a Greek, it was no accident that he couldn't find it. All right. uh, but still, we did not attack him in the public because it was a critical moment, and it was not an appropriate time to attack him. I spoke at Morehouse two weeks, uh, 10 days before the march, they changed my speech from none that call it conspiracy to the assassination of Malcolm X. What do you think somebody was trying to goat me to go out and say 10 days before the march with all the press in Atlanta in the room? You see, it was set, uh, somebody gets on the radio in Chicago and tells Minister Farrakhan, somebody shot at Steve Coakley, didn't you do it? 
And then 50 people call me in D.C. I'm on my way to Pittsburgh. I pick up the phone and call a station and go right through on the air and say, them people who are raising those questions are not speaking for me. I'm live and uncensored. All my speaking is on the table. And besides that, this is not the moment for that dialogue, and I don't appreciate someone pushing it on the air, but these are critical moments, and any whole cards would be pulled, if it could be pulled, to stop the overriding good. In fact, these brothers know I stood up in front of my speech the night before, two nights before the Million Man March, and said that I was, because, see, I'm the attack. So if I get up, I got to attack. Because I'm focused on these things. So now I'm compelled. I'm trying to hold water and not bust their ass too tough while they're around the corner repudiating us. We're trying not to bring up certain subjects that would let the hunky dig into some disunity by just being, we said, the hunky will not get the weekend off. While we're atoning, another flank will whack his ass. But we did not aggress on other brothers. And that was a principle that was not even collaborative, it was just done in the spirit of the moment. But didn't nobody really bite, everything got said. But it was just interesting that we were willing to be such brothers but got so little respect. There was much, much to be learned about those moments. It was a very awesome, awesome, awesome weekend. So now what happens? What happens in these communities? It'd be interesting to ask some of the people, especially in the leadership, who were atoning, excuse me, just what specifically were you atoning for, sir? Because some shit I'd like to get cleaned up, but I don't know if that was in the package that they washed. You know what I mean? I, I just got some loose ends out there I want to just square. And so as they was washing, I just want to know, did they wash certain things? Because we just need to know them things. Anyway, that's another discussion. Uh, let me say this. Uh, back on that table, uh, I want to explain uh, what's back there. There's a video back there called Insights from the Black Side. It's about the attack on me in Chicago uh, that shot the windows out. Uh, I have never asked anyone to follow me anywhere. And I gave a lecture in DC called Can I Cut a Hole in Your Fence? Uh, which is out there in audio tape, and I raised the question of whether or not people really wanted liberation, and was I just a brother with a passion with no constituency? And I raised the question about whether or not I needed to get a job to support my family and give up on something people really didn't want. And I debated that in the public. And that then, I went to Chicago and, and, and got the feeling it was time to amalgamate and announced I was going to start forming these grassroots 2000s around the country or organizations that dealt specifically with developing preferred worlds for African people. Futuristic component to the African liberation connection. We have no college trained futurologists. There is no futurology curriculum. And every day we struggle through the day to day when in fact our day should be a part of a greater plan. Right. And our futurologist and part of the process is to study white preferred worlds which will make you pissed enough about this world that you will get up and write your own world and fight for it with your behavior. And that's a, something that we must come forth with. For those that are interested in that, take your name and a phone number, put in a pile. To go to a grassroots 2000 meeting, you must bring an article, a book, a magazine, or something on the future. That's how you get in. And when you bring it in, you've got to describe it about why or what of it you brought it for so that you will be compelled to teach other people specific information that you found a process of doing something in a collective way will come out. And we've been holding these meetings in D.C. and I've been stunned by how people who sat and listened to me at lectures had inside of them all of the talent that they ever thought they saw in me. And it was just not my job to talk at the people, but to bring out of people even greater things than myself. And that's important for all of us to be responsible for making more things rather than just doing things. The ability to create is one thing. Somebody wants to maintain, that's one thing. We need maintainers, but we need initiators. We need penetrators. 
We need fighters. We need translators. And they need to, I'm in these colleges, these students are fighting with whether or not their character is valid by whether or not they pass a class from a funky white teacher. And some of their very feelings in life are on the line about whether they fa pass or fail some, some deception. And we've got to rescue people from false dilemmas of test of their character so that they aren't all worn out when the big fight comes. Now everybody got to live like they got something to fight for. It's on. If you don't know nothing else, you can smell the shit, the shit is on. And again, at the height of their greatest disunity, you are getting together. Isn't it just strange that it happens? It just, that past all they did, the shit just come together like that? Do you think that was a mere accident? You think that was just happenstantial? Do you think these things just manifested in front of everybody for no reason at all? It's about an even greater day. Days sustained. What if we stayed in the mall until the white man left town? They left town that weekend, too. They all got out of it. They was in all them hotels. They was all out of town. They were all out of town. But I, I suggest you get the tape insights from the black side. It talks about the assassination attempt in Chicago. My buddy over here, Hebrew, he puts out a phony description of the shooters and shit. Is he still there? He is. He's still over there. He puts out, I ain't been, he been on punishment since then because he be messing, he do some good shit, then he do some dumb shit. And then, I don't, he a brother, you know, you don't want to punish him and shit, but to put out a false description and to tell people to call him for further information was a violation. I had told him don't do that shit before. He'd done the shit in the past. And I would not spend a second not telling you that because I want you to, I don't want you to be confused by how we standing. I like the brother, but he on punishment right now. And you must have, these brothers understand me, in LA, these cities where I work with brothers, Eric knows if we ain't getting along, he called me 50 times. If something between us, I ain't picking up the phone. And he will say, okay, brother, I've called my 50th time, call me when, you, when we can talk. And we can say, oh, Madison, I can sit down and go back to a conversation we had two and a half years ago and remember everything that affected us personally in the conversation. Because you don't forget those things that touch you. And this brother could be an awesome brother, but he keep wanting to go back to the back of the line. And I just, I just don't know. This brother over here, Trent, this is an awesome brother here. This is the strongest one of the strongest soldiers we got. And he had to fight to stay alive to be a soldier because it ain't no money in soldiering. And this brother suffers. No, I hate to see a brother suffer. What does it mean to see a brother that has talent that may have to suffer for money? It ain't good. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts to see a man have a life profession and be denied access to it. It hurts. It hurts when you know a brother love another woman, but he can't approach her because he don't have money. It hurts when a brother loses his family, not that he don't love them, but he can't care for them. And we talked that Saturday about what a brother really feels that went in to make them brothers show up at that march. All the things a brother goes through, hurt, hidden hurt. Who wants to be a man that can't feed his family? Who want to be that? Somebody go out every day trying to get with something, can't make their own thing, and can't get with nothing and just be locked in an abyss and have to turn to another person and say, I can't be there with you because I can't sustain myself. All the days I pick up that phone and have to beg to support my family. If I didn't feel I had a greater purpose, I would break down making them calls. Because it ain't no reason a brother with the skills that I have to want for anything. And I'm not saying any good thing. I mean the basic thing. But we have not yet shown these higher characteristics. And don't worry about me. I'm built to suffer and to make it. We are going to win this thing. We are in 
the right position. Remember the position we're supposed to be in, on the rail, hole in third, waiting for them to say, here they come spinning out of the turn. It's white supremacy in first. It's corporate leadership in second. And here come the black revolution. <laughs> Remember that moment. It also has a two-edged sword about seeing what happened at the march. Now the whites know it's possible. Before they thought they had it covered. And that means now they're not going to make some of the mistakes they made in the past. Underestimating, I told you the greatest strength to the black revolution was its underestimation. But now they got a peek at what shouldn't have been shown until the last days. That's right. Now they know that we got some shit deep inside of ourselves, says the living God is a vengeful God. <laughs> and we know this, and so they got a peek. And that was awesome that now even peeking, what would have happened if OJ had been found guilty before the march? What would, what would have, have happened differently if it had been guilty? And wasn't it unusual, after being the benefactor of all of that black power, them two brothers, Cochran and Simpson, got out in the public and proved late in the ninth that still they can't be all the way brothers at this stage of their development in spite of how far we brought them through. Ain't, ain't no group out there called Hunkies for OJ. It was mothers and women who in spite, it was his wife who fought, his first wife, the sister, who fought taking that subpoena from the Hunkies, who had to trick her out of her house to put a subpoena on her to come against a man that didn't treat her right. That's black solidarity. Boy, see his mama sit there and say, she said, she said this line when they had her in the courtroom and she gave the press conference. She said this particular line. She said, I can't remember it, but it was, huh? And there was something about those who give faith to the Lord in the end shall be vindicated. Some shit like that. I don't Somebody say it out loud. Prayers of the righteous prevail. Availeth much. Mm, that was deep. And then look in all the confusion that Shapiro's cheeks is hurt. And white Shapiro fights white F. Lee Bailey, even though Bailey is the godfather to Shapiro's baby. See, in the end, even white winners can't get along. These are indicators of the oncoming revolution. He liked Canada, that's right. 50% to 49, couldn't split the honky. You're gonna walk right through one to say, look here brothers, I'm dead, but y'all kicked that ass for me. I sucked a lot of butt to be an actor. Step and fetch it. Rochester, all of them who suffered. Amos and Ann, Kingfish and shit. Henry Aaron. Satchel Paige, all the suffering these brothers went about to be a brother, how much they felt in their dead spirits to see that day materialize. Last time that many people got together, they got together for Marcus Garvey. They talking about the biggest marches ever. They ain't counting all the shit. Because they can't think back too far. You know how they do? If you had a million in money, if it was 1917, today it'd be worth 20 million. If you got a million with no radio and TV in 1920, how many do that equate in 1995 electronically? All right. Anyway. There's a tape back there called Counterinsurgency Then and Now in a radio show between Coakley and Karinga. You should want to hear that. There's some historic moments in there as Coakley talks about the development of rumor control networks with Eleanor Holmes Norton here in New York working for Rockefeller. Kurt Smoke having one in Baltimore, the one that went down in Chicago, presently run by Clarence Woods, who come out of the New York Urban League, 
and the one that went in LA with Rabbi Wolf and Kenny Hahn that was assisted by some of our leadership. There's also a tape back there called uh, Revolution 103. If there's any of them left, I did it in New Haven, Connecticut. They're in New Haven, Connecticut. Remember the boule is based upon, the boule is based upon the skull and bones at Yale. So I go to Yale. This brother groomed some brothers up in New Haven. I go to New Haven, Connecticut. I'm telling them about it tonight. At the Boule Convention, we found nine empty squares. They went Sigma, nine empty squares, Pi, nine empty squares, Phi. I'm telling New Haven that I found these nine empty squares, and they say, Steve, hold it, hold it, hold it. New Haven is the city of the nine squares. I was at Morehouse two weeks ago. I'm telling them about what happened weird when I was at New Haven. And then we in the Martin King Chapel is 2,000 of them Huxtable children in the room sitting at the feet of Brother Coakley trying to learn a lesson that was denied at their campus. But they fought to get the brother in there. And when I get down there, they got a new president of Morehouse named Walter Massey. This is a man who was a part of the Chicago Community Trust that brought Clarence Woods into Chicago to investigate the Coakley question. Walter Massey is on the board of the University of Chicago, on the board of First Chicago, on the board of Commonwealth Edison, and is, was the head of Argonne National Laboratory, sent to D.C. to run the National Science Foundation, and is Rockefeller's main nigga in Chicago, is now the president of Morehouse. So when I get there and they call me and they say, do you know of this Massey being in the boule? I said, well, I know a Massey in Chicago was in the boule. They said, that's the guy. <laughs> and boy, I asked them 2,000 students, do you know who endowed your university? You go over to Spelman and say, Spelman Administration Building, Rockefeller uh, 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 Student Center, uh, 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 Laura Rockefeller Dorm. Everything got Rockefeller all over the place while the Olympics are on the way. And I asked, I said, hey, who endowed the money for this school? And they could not tell me. So I told them that in the morning, I want you to go to those various offices at your schools and demand a list of the endowers. I know who they are, but unless they go see them, they won't be appropriately angry. So they go off at about 10 o'clock. I'm walking on the Spelman campus, shooting these pictures of the Rockefeller stuff so I can show y'all at another date. And I get over to the administration building, and the lobby is loaded with women standing there demanding the endowment list and being told as students they don't have the right to know who gave money to the school. Yes, they told them that the first time they went. And they got angry, Jack, and they didn't know how angry to be until they found out they were being denied something from people who got tax exemptions for doing it. It has to be public. <laughs> but at 2,000 people in the lecture that night, we have a follow-up afternoon lecture doing classes, still get 700 students, but they line up and testify to their experiences of getting those lists. But we look up on the wall of the Martin King Chapel and there's nine squares in that wall and nine squares in that wall. And we figured out we had come up on something. I found something that's in a tape back there called To Catch the Devil. I found something called a cherub. Found out, you know, the Grecian Sphinx is this body of a lion, the... That's the Boule logo there. You see that? I mean, I know you can't see it, see it. And I messed up uh, Brother Maddox by not asking uh, the family to bring the over here. Right. Because if I had a been better prepared, I could have uh, painted that. Uh, and uh, um, I wanted to show this cherub trying to get away from me. Uh, it's up here somewhere. I'm looking for this magazine. Uh, here we go. 
Now, you remember we talked about the Grecian Sphinx. This is the Boulay logo. In fact, this is the Boulay audit and budget book. Uh, we took it from the Boulay convention. <laughs> and even though all y'all told me y'all was going, what didn't but 10 people show? See, I know ain't gonna be no unity around no enemy. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Right. Uh, this is the Boule logo, and this is uh, a comedic version. This is uh, what we found in a white magazine called Biblio, Biblical Archaeological Review, the issue dated July, August 95. Here you see a comedic face with the body of a lion, the wings of a bird, but you see a black woman's face. Here's the Boule version they took and made the face white woman. All right, that's a fact. But in this magazine, it's about these symbols that they said they found representing the gods of Kemet. And it says that in, it's the first thing in the magazine, it says Greeks were the first philosophers in the world. Right, and my initial reaction was, wasn't that facetious for them to say that? But let me tell you why they said that. They said that the people of Kemet did not philosophize about God because for them, God was all-knowing and all-present. So they lived God. He said, but we, the impersonators, the Greeks, were the first philosopher because we had no relationship with God. Therefore, we philosophized God. In the last days, many things will come. We just have to be prepared to interpret them correctly. In the meantime, they are arguing over whether the embassy going to Jerusalem and it picked 1999. See, all hell being broke out by then. Just kind of intriguing. Cherubim, God's throne. And interesting, they say they found these in Kemet and they were carved on mantles of five by four, which is nine. Now remember, we find out that the boule is using these nine squares. In between it gets sigma, something indistinguishable, nine squares, something indistinguishable, pi. Sigma, something, pi, something, phi. And what we found was the nine squares. The nine squares, as a sister told me, she brought me this, uh, said that those nine squares are called the nine chambers of the Kabbalah. And it says that in, that, and they're also are known as the squares of Saturn. Now what is it about Saturn? that we should know. I'm asking you this, I do not know. I have found these things, I thrust them back to you, you deeper translate them to me, I then communicate them to the rest of the Africans. You understand the process? That's how we got to where we got to. I may have found a line, I threw it to you, you deepened the line and made it a highway. I took the highway across the byway and explained the speed we were going. Okay, what's to Saturn? I just, anybody, take a peek, you take time, just look through it. I got a call the other day, brother told me I need to find a, a poem by John Keating called The Ode to the Grecian Urn. Said it's something deep in there related to the stuff I'm studying. Also, we then found, uh, we were studying this, uh, in, in D.C., there's a park called Meridian Hill Park. This is in To Get to the Devil. Meridian Hill Park sits right on 16th Street. Thomas Jefferson wanted to make it the meridian of the world. You put a compass over and the compass goes all around and shit. Found out that there's a statue overlooking that part by, uh, of Dante. Dante is famous for the Divine Comedy or a description of something called Inferno. So right on 16th Street there's this dialogue about what Jefferson, a Rosicrucian, Illuminatus, Mason who wanted to make it the center of the world, wanted the White House right in front of it, now we got Dante standing over it, and Dante spoke of inferno or hell. So we out to catch the devil. Because what we're really doing in lieu of everything is searching out the core of negativity to destroy it. And I fantasize about the day we hold the head up of evil and cut it from its neck and hold that head up to the people, for that will be in the last days. That will happen without a doubt. And uh, so we found these nine squares and we're intrigued by all of that. We're intrigued by this, and then we look up, here come the movie Seven, and what are they talking about, Dante 
and A Paradise Lost with Milton. They're talking about where's hell. And then if you check, Morgan Freeman in the flick sits up and talks about how the FBI got certain information tabbed so that if you look up certain things, they got people watching what people are watching. But then we don't get our information from there anyway. We get them from each other. Therefore, we beat the system. Because then we don't go through the avenues they look at. And they think we don't know, but we know more than they thought we knew. Anyway, that's excessively important for all of us. Um, last thing I would like to say, I'm most appreciative for all of you uh, who have kept the slave an institution. Uh, you all were a concern for everybody in the nation when the question of white people arose. <laughs> but it was an important stand and the fact that the whole country watched carefully what happened here and the fact that you are still here and remain black is an uh, outstanding achievement for our community. I appreciate humbly, uh, as a brother, the opportunity to share with you, uh, and I seek to help preserve and protect your institution uh, that you share here with the people. It would be great if some of those people who were on the stage who make big money would give 35, 40, 50, 70,000 to the slave and allow it to maybe build a balcony or fix the hole in the ceiling or build another building. This is good for African people. Now those good philanthropists need to, if you can't sweat it, then pay for it. All right. And we'll sweat it. That's it. But it needs to be done. There must be people who can save African people who are starving but have great roles to play. That's right. It must be done. It's mandatory uh, or we'll die. And we must, protect, we must protect our point or our penetrators. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having the chance to be with all of you uh, tonight. Uh, I could talk for many more hours. Uh, you know that uh, I'm not short of wind. Uh, but I even believe the brother back there selling my tapes supposed to be to work at midnight, and it's about 5 to 12. So I think I better get back there and relieve him. Uh, I'm really humbled by the opportunity and most appreciative. I'm glad to have uh, had the chance to have talked with a Brother Maddox and to have hugged with the brother. And because of that, we had a chance to spend some of the moments that we had here today. And I'm most appreciative about those small things that creep up on us that make us bigger and greater people. And I've always asked you to look always deep at the metaphysical side of the revolution for to be a revolutionary is to really master the other side of life. For you get deeply confused in earthly things. And I've always said that the themes were before the eyes can see, one must be incapable of tears. Before the voice can speak, it must be incapable of wounding. For one to sit at the height where sit the masters, one must serve where light does not shine at all. And finally, on the path, you will meet people of like character. And with them, you will form a bond that needs no utterance of mere words. Hotel. Let's give Brother Steve Coakley a round, strong applause, Brother Steve Coakley. Thank you very much. We made it. I want everybody to hold hands. We're out of here right now. Everybody hold hands. Those who are going up the aisle, turn around. And grab somebody and, and make the affirmation. For tonight, we want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. James McIntosh, uh, Brother Eric Muhammad. We want to thank Brother Malik, Zulu Shabazz, Brother Hebrew and Brother Prophet T, who have come with him tonight to be with us here at the Slave Theater, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, uh, we certainly welcome his presence, Brother Eric Muhammad, and certainly our keynote speaker for tonight, Brother Steve Coakley, who has certainly given us a broad agenda in order to deal with it. I also want to acknowledge my granddaughter, Malaysia, who uh, constantly wants to remind you that she's around. Uh, 
let me just simply say that Carol Taylor is, is ill, and certainly we want to send our prayers and our concerns for her and any of us who knows how to reach Carol, and most of us should have her telephone number, uh, we should make some effort to let her know of our concern. Uh, let me simply say that this is a very busy weekend. Uh, there's a lot on the plate this weekend. This should be a very activist weekend. Certainly it's a week that's moving right into Black Solidarity Day. As I give the schedule for this weekend, I'm really asking all of you tomorrow to jam the radios and make sure that our people come out in mass to the things that are happening. Uh, most of you do not call in and you let these escapees from Bellevue uh, uh, monopolize the radio line. Y'all need to change that tomorrow. We got some serious work to do this weekend and uh, we cannot afford to listen to these nuts uh, monopolize radio every day. Some serious things that are happening. Let, let me simply remind you very quickly. Friday night, two venues. All right, my lady, should be cool. Friday night, two venues, one PS258, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Yosef ben and Dr. Scobie, uh, and Utrecht's lead will be emceeing. And then over at Harriet Tubman School in Manhattan, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, that's at 630. These two events are on Friday. There are enough of us here in New York to pack both of those places. Uh, so it shouldn't be no problem. We need to be there. Saturday morning, those of the United African Movement, you got your letter, you know what we're going to be doing. Uh, those of you who want to be nosy about what we do, uh, go by the membership table tonight and join up. And then you can really uh, get a real uh, lecture and real discussions. Uh, those who are members, uh, pack the place, and we're certainly looking forward to having all of you out on f Saturday morning. And then all day Saturday, the Holocaust Conference. You'll get further information from that from Brother Eric tomorrow as you listen to the various radio stations. That's Saturday. Then Sunday, 6 o'clock, 45th and Broadway, the Hudson Theater. It's very important that we all are there and make sure that Jay Diamond and all of these racist politicians are not. Uh, we need to circle the place. Uh, it's a time for the million black men to show up in Times Square. That's Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. All of us will be there with CMOTAP uh, to deal with all of the races as they congregate in one place. This is a great opportunity for us to get rid of them once and for all. Uh, it's the biggest mistake they've ever made, the greatest opportunity we will ever have. Uh, so we need to take advantage of it. If you want to really bring an end to racism, we will bring an end to racism. We don't need no crackers from the American Institute, American Enterprise Institute uh, to uh, fantasize about it. We can t end racism Sunday evening at 6 o'clock by showing up at the Hudson Theater, 45th and Broadway. All of you who are sick and tired of living under white supremacy should be there as we bring an end to it uh, Sunday evening in the spirit of our ancestors who suffered so much from these crackers. And then on Monday morning, all roads leads to Philadelphia, 8 o'clock right here. If you haven't signed up, you should go, go in the back. If you don't have the money, don't worry about it. I'd keep digging deep in my pocket. Y'all wasn't that great tonight. Uh, so uh, y'all know what that means. At some point, y'all know these crackers going to come and pick me up for uh, writing all these bad checks and all of that. But y'all don't care. Y'all keep giving y'all money to the preachers and let me go out there and engage in all kinds of funky activities so that we can be back here next week. And so uh, just for all of that, we will be back next week as we watch the Ethiopian star, the rise of the black man, next Wednesday night. Rain, shine, sleet, or snow, whether you have any money or not, uh, Robert Finch will be here, uh, and I, will, I have already bought the ticket. So whether y'all come up with anything or not, it don't mean nothing. Uh, because, hey, I ain't got one life to live, and I'm living it. And so uh, being that, uh, please call in and energize our community. There's a lot of activity. We want to support CMATAP. We want to support all the other activities that are going on. 
And um, it's up to you tomorrow and Friday to really energize and hit Bob Law tonight uh, and give Bob the schedule and tell him to pump long and hard. We're an African people. Robbed from our homeland. Robbed of our names. Our languages. Our cultures. Our religions. Our womanhood. Our manhood. Our sisterhood. Our brotherhood. Our motherhood. Our fatherhood. And our self-respect. But we shall rise. Never to fall again. Up ye mighty race. You can accomplish what you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace.